I don't know what I, Monopoly being the banker for that, that just really excited me. Yeah. Like, I remember harassing mum and my brother <laughs> to play during school holidays, saying, "Hey guys, let's get this started, like, yeah. and let's play for days because this is what I want to do." Hello and welcome to season two of the Push Podcast. This is the podcast where we explore the real stories behind what makes entrepreneurs and business owners the successes they are today. I am Jack Ferguson, a small business growth strategist, and I will be your host. I believe the best way to learn and be inspired is to listen to the experiences and stories of those you respect. Their real experiences, their real story, warts and all. Honest storytelling is what this is all about. Show notes can be found at bethepush.com forward slash podcast. And don't forget to hit subscribe wherever you are listening to this. Welcome to episode 11 of season 2. Today's guest is Morgan Wilson, founder of Credit. Credit being spelt C-R-E-D-I-T-T-E. Morgan is an accountant and business advisor who takes the complexity out of numbers and guides business owners through the ups and downs of running their business. He does this so business owners can have the comfort and confidence to make the right decisions for themselves, their business and their family. Credit is the accounting firm and vehicle he uses to do this. Morgan started his business during COVID, which makes for intriguing storytelling, and we discuss exactly how that came to be. We also talk about a couple of mistakes he made early on in his business journey, how Monopoly sparked his fascination in business, his thoughts on formal education and how that has helped slash hindered his professional development, what his first day was like as an accountant, it was particularly challenging, how it can be lonely to be a business owner, and what the startup community has done better than the SME community. Of course, we cover much more over the next hour, so get ready to hear Morgan's story. Let's meet him now. Morgan, how are you doing today? I'm well, thanks, mate. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Thanks for, thanks for coming in. Mate, thank you very much for having us. Really appreciate it. I'm excited to, to hear a lot of what you've got to say. There's a lot here that we can cover today. So, very excited to hear about uh, the story of credit and your own story. But where I wanted to start and what was interesting about your story as I read through my notes is that you started credit to warm applause, right? You started it and you had a lot of support from family and friends. Uh, Can you start with telling us what happened there? And I've got a couple of questions I want to ask afterwards. Yeah, for sure, mate. So I'm very fortunate enough that we sort of started credit as a bit of a side gig and actually having support of my employer at the time to say, go ahead and keep doing it, mate, because you need to have your skills you know, sharp and you don't want to lose it for a couple of years and come back to it, um, which was very fortunate on that side of things. So had it as a bit of a side gig and it built up over time. So we actually only really announced credit six, seven months ago mm-hmm. and sort of the announcement on social media and things like that and just the outpour of support from different people, not just friends and family who you kind of expect to support you, but mates who you went to high school with you haven't spoken to in 10, 12 years. And they catch, say, hey, mate, well done for having a crack. That's awesome. How can I support you? And you kind of go, I didn't expect this at all. And it sort of just gives you that warm and fuzzy feeling when you announce a business. It's like I had a friend of ours who started their own hair salon and just the outpour of support that she had the same thing and you kind of see what happens on the flip side and you go, that's amazing at how people can come together and support each other. People do Mm. business with people they like, I guess, and they want to throw their full weight behind supporting them and them having a crack. Yeah. Now, that, it's really cool because the reason I wanted to ask about it is there's that saying that you get a new job and you'll get 300 likes on Facebook. You know, buy a house, you get 300 likes on Facebook. Start a business, you get three likes on Facebook. <laughs> so, that really stuck out to me that that wasn't the case for you. Do you have a, an idea of why you had so much support? Oh, mate, I think it was... I've always communicated to this to people as sort of like the dream is I've always wanted to do this. I've always wanted to own my own business and especially within a an accounting business so I think people were just willing to support someone who's having a crack at the dream Mm -hmm. Um, that's what I've kind of put it down to I mean a lot of friends and family supported as I said like you'd expect but the people who come out of the woodworks to kind of say oh hey mate I haven't spoken to you in years that's awesome and you get phone calls likes comments and the the rest of it which I was surprised because I was expecting three likes yeah and that was it (laughs) but it ended up being 300 or I forget what it ended up being at the end of the day, but mm. it ended up being quite surprising because yeah. I don't really post much on social media. Right. So I had the announcement and 
I was kind of surprised and my phone almost ran out of battery by the end yeah, of it. Wow. So. <laughs> yeah, well, that's a, it's a good way to start. I'd be interested in how many people who said they were going to help out, how many people did help out? Most of them did actually. Really? Like, I was actually genuinely, like the outpour of support was yeah. amazing. Like I can't speak, I could probably speak for the next hour about it okay. and how warm and fuzzy it was. Um, but people were just saying, cool, mate, I'll catch up with you in a couple of months' time. Um when you know tax time comes around and let's have a chat or whatever it might be and i was like oh and then it actually came around to the time and and they did and they did okay and i was like oh well that, i'm not usually used to this usually you sort of say yeah mate sounds good and, and you ghost them and that's yeah. it so. yeah. <laughs> don't hear from again yeah. yeah yeah it's a i've always advised my clients to be very very cautious with what people say they'll do and but and what they'll actually do. look yeah. look at what they actually do yeah but amazing that for you it sounds like it's going really well yeah mate. very fortunate the other thing that i know went very well for you towards the start of the business is setting up a website i believe oh mate very much the opposite um <laughs> at this mate if uh the push podcast ever becomes sponsored by squarespace i don't want to trash them now to, to ruin the chances of that it's all good uh, say, what you, say what you think ex- mate if for anyone else who listens to other podcasts basically every podcast under the sun has been sponsored by squarespace and they make the process sound so simple. To You can do your website in 15 minutes. You'll be up and running in no time. How good. So I thought, oh, okay, cool. Starting up the business. You know, you need a website as a bit of a shop front these days just to kind of tell you who you are, what you do, and here's how you get in touch with us. So I thought, okay, cool. I reckon I could do that. Because you sometimes hear people on YouTube and stuff, and here's how I made a website in minutes. Yeah. Cool. Excellent. Watched a couple of those. Started to get ready. I spent hours on mm. it absolute hours on it. I was pouring so much time into it. I finished it and I went, this is shit. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, it looked okay. I'm probably being a bit too tough on myself there, but it was awful um, at the end of the day. And the lesson learned, and I had a friend of mine who was starting up his own business at the time and I kind of thought, well, here's a great way to show the support that they showed me starting up that I can show them starting up. And that's how we've got the website that we've got today. Right. I still have the website, sa- like the Squarespace website saved on Squarespace just for when I want to have a bit of a laugh. Um, but that's kind nice. of where we're sitting on that front. So it was, um, you need to engage experts, mm-hmm. I think was the lesson learned there. It was just, if you want to build a house, go talk to a builder. Yep. If you want to get your tooth fixed, go talk to a dentist. <laughs> Don't look it up online and have a crack yourself. That's the reason why we are what we are doing. So. <laughs> and did you do that to save costs? Was it to... Yeah. yeah. I just thought, let's just bootstrap this for sounding like a startup. Let's give it a bit of a crack and doing it ourselves and see what happens. And then you kind of look at how affordable sometimes websites can be. Mm. And you have, I probably wasted the amount, probably more working on this website which yeah. was a fun little learning experience at the yeah. end of the day rather than going ahead and paying someone to do it mm-hmm. so learn that lesson pretty quick i think that's always a, a good lesson to learn up yeah. front um if you can so right and do you feel you've stuck to paying the experts when time has come because we can still fall or some people can fall back into that mindset of oh no it's all right i'll do it i'll save it save a couple of grand and <laughs> and that's that's something that i, I see clients doing and yeah. i was always really guilty of it too to kind of go no nah, it's all right i'll i'll do it myself mm-hmm. because it's the easiest way for business owners to shave on the margin is because oh well i don't pay myself anyway so yeah. i'll do it myself and save some money on that you're always better off paying someone else because it's not worth the headspace it's mm. you just get ahead and do it i we migrated from um g suite to 365 and there are, you know, guides on how to do it online. And I was about this close to doing it myself. Yeah, yeah. And I thought, no, I'm going to call someone. I'm going to get a couple of quotes. I'm going to see what's happening. And I engaged a professional to do it because it wouldn't have ended up the way that it ended up if I had done it. Mm, so yeah. it is neat. I can understand why people fall into that trap of doing it themselves. Yeah. But I'm always, if I can pass that off to someone else, excellent. Mm-hmm. It's interesting you mentioned the headspace there because that's sometimes not thought about and everyone looks at the financial cost and this is what's going to cost this is what it'll cost if you know this is what i'll save if i do it myself but but there's also the cost of yeah the headspace it takes for you that then to focus on that for yeah. however long and be stressed about it and not know what you're doing and really learning a new skill mm. you know to an extent anyway not really worth it no nah, and I look at that, that headspace really comes from my time in real estate. Okay. Um, and you look at salespeople and how they operate 
and not just within real estate but salespeople full stop and you kind of see their headspace and how that kind of travels along when they have a great month if they have a couple of great months you'll see them kind of crash down after that because you can't support that level of activity yourself for that long and I'm a big fan of that headspace kind of spot because you you look at that and you go, all I'm doing is frustrating myself with something that I know I can't do. Mm. I could spend the next few months learning how to build a website and I'm sure mm. it'll work out well or mm. well enough. But if I could spend that time working on my own business, getting accounting clients, getting you know our bookkeeping clients, all those things up and running, then it makes more sense for me to spend more time on that yeah. and pay someone to do the website yeah, or right. pay someone to implement Microsoft 365. So, yeah, for sure. Uh, yeah, and you spending your time on the highest leverage yep. activity. Exactly. Yeah. The the other thing that's interesting about you, your business is starting in COVID and almost it sounds like you were inundated with people wanting advice on this, advice on this, JobKeeper was out and that, that was yeah, for I'm, you a, almost a good thing, I guess, COVID in a way. Good and bad. I think it kind of reinforced skills that I kind of had lying dormant there okay. and I think for a lot of accountants I think that reinforced a lot of skills that they had but they don't quite come to the forefront all the time in conversation you're running contingency planning like with the business that I was working for at the time at Ray White it was all sorts of contingency planning what happens if our sales drop by 50% what happens if people can't pay rent and if you're looking at the two levers as to how real estate businesses make money you're going oh no this this might not look good if people can't pay rent and if people can't sell their houses, yeah. what are we going to do? <laughs> so you're running through all this backup planning, contingency planning, cash flow forecasting with all these different scenarios. And you go, wow, this is, everyone's got these questions. What happens with JobKeeper? What happens if we're not eligible for JobKeeper? What happens there? <laughs> and you're running through all this scenario planning, not just for my employer at the time, but clients or old clients were calling up out of the woodwork saying, hey, mate, what do you think about this? Do you reckon we'll be eligible for JobKeeper? It was a really stressful time, but it was something that, I look back on and kind of go, if you can handle that, you can just about handle whatever accounting can throw at you in right. terms of that. Um, it was a great learning experience. It was bloody stressful, but a great mm-hmm. learning experience. So, well, fingers crossed it never rolls around again, but if it does, <laughs> we're all prepared. So, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, for sure. And talk me through actually making the decision to, so you CFO of Array White at the time, and there must have been a time or an event or something that happened that you go, mm. I've got to really pull the pin on this and I've really got to go out on my own. How did that look when you actually made the decision to do that? It was something that when I first got the tax agent's license and I first got everything, I was kind of like, oh, this will just be a bit of a bit of a side gig. I'll keep rolling around because I was really enjoying it and I was really enjoying doing both sides, having you know, a couple of clients on the side that you were still available for, you'd still help out and you'd still have you know a salaried gig, which is mm. great. You've got this guaranteed income over here and this sort of variable income over there. Awesome. Let's keep going. Um, But it was really about sort of coming to the realisation that to follow the dream there. And I guess for for the story that kind of brought it on was a personal story on that front. Um, Sort of up until that point, I was 30. I was working for Ray White. I thought it was phenomenal. I'd just been married married for a couple of years by that point. Um, My wife was pregnant and I thought we bought our first house together. Life couldn't get any better. I thought I'm invincible. How good's this? Um, And unfortunately, what happens is we got to 22 weeks and it's not exactly goes according to plan. Um, And that was a big catalyst personally to kind of go that you're vulnerable. You're a person at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. You do exist within the world and shit things happen often. And sometimes to good people, sometimes to bad people, sometimes to just average people, shit things happen all the time. Mm -hmm. And that was sort of a time to sort of step back and reflect on that for, for my wife and I to kind of go, well, where do we actually want to go and what do we actually want to do? Um, try and make a good thing out of a bad thing because up until that point we sort of had all right this is the path that everyone takes we'll we'll have kids we've just bought the house let's go about doing it we sat down had a bit of a chat and i was like look i really want to i want to do this because i'd spoken about it forever so mm-hmm. my wife and i've probably known each other about six years i want to say off the top of my head right and i've always spoken about it okay. even to her yeah um family members everyone mm-hmm. i was like i really want to do this and it was sort of something that we were planning on going down to one income anyway. It just happened to be in reverse. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's how credit sort of started out the back of that. It kind of started in the woodworks to kind of go, okay, cool, let's let's get things happening. Let's get everything moving mm-hmm. to eventually pull the trigger on it. And that's that's how it happened. So try to make a good thing out of yeah. a bad thing. Um, and that's how we, we ended up with credit. Right. Uh, obviously, firstly, sorry to hear about the circumstances. Oh, that 
came about. That's uh, that's not good to hear at all. But uh, it's good to hear that that credit's going well now. And uh, what I would be interested in though is you talk about this dream that you had of running an accounting <laughs> business. When did that start? Can you can you think back to when you actually had that initial? Yep, the initial dream. It was when I first actually. I didn't actually love accounting. I didn't love studying it. Yeah. And I didn't really love it in the first couple of years <laughs> either. But there was a couple of old partners in the first firm that I worked at that had all these fingers in different pies. And I thought, how cool is that? They have a little part of a restaurant. They've got a little part of a steel manufacturing business. And I thought, I just thought you did people's tax returns the whole time. This is so cool. And that's sort of where the ball started rolling with going, all right, if I could do this and just kind of leverage that into a couple of different areas and things like that, then you actually really build some fun out of it, mm. you know, which was, it fascinated me seeing how these directors and partners, however you use it interchangeably these days, um, how they use their money, what they were doing there and what they, you know, what property they'd bought. I was always guilty of being a little bit of a snoop, sorry guys, um, <laughs> and seeing where where they had their money. And I was kind of like, this this is kind of, I like this. Mm. This this could be the means to the end that, that you want to get to. So that's how it all started. Yeah, right. What I was anticipating I was going to hear was um, even back further when you enjoyed being the banker in Monopoly when as a oh, kid. Mate, that, <laughs> I don't know what... I, Monopoly being the banker, for that, that just really excited me. Yeah. Like, I remember harassing mum and my brother <laughs> to play during school holidays, saying, hey, guys, let's get this started. Like, yeah. And let's play for days because this is what I want to do. Um, mm. And I, I attribute that to sort of getting started with business and being fascinated by business mm-hmm. um, at a very simple level yeah. in a board game of all things. But it always made me question sort of, oh, well, how do they make money? Or how does, how does this transpire and things like that? So it's a great foundation in learning how to do business. Mm. Right. And you get a second chance at it if you like and you get out of jail free and all those kinds of things, which you don't often get in life. Um, but it gives you those kinds of foundations to learn a bit of persistence as yeah. well and kind of, you know, keep having a crack. Yep. You've got to go around going, you'll collect 200 bucks and yep. keep giving, giving it a crack. So Deal with some adversity and yeah. land on someone else's yeah. hotel that you didn't want to land on and have to <laughs> cough up some cash and unfortunately got to find it from somewhere now there's a few parallels isn't there to running a, a business but uh, yeah absolutely <laughs> and so why why do accounting at uni like what made you choose to do that then honestly mate it was a backup yeah. plan yeah right it was a backup plan i was kind of good at it in high school i was doing okay at it it made sense accounting's not too hard at the end of the day in the fact that your debits have got to match your credits and you know you're doing a good job um it was something on that front that i kind of went okay cool i have a bit of a interest in it accounting is the language of business after all and i kind of thought if i get a hold of that if i want to be a business owner at the end of the day well let's learn accounting because at least i'll be somewhat you know functional with numbers Mm -hmm. that's where it started and i really didn't like it in the beginning um, I probably didn't like it all the way through, if I'm honest. So, didn't like it at uni or didn't like it when didn't you started like it at uni? Work? Right, okay. And I was kind of like, all right, cool. I'll keep chipping away at the backup plan. Don't worry about it. Then you get three years into your degree and kind of go, this is going a bit too far for a backup plan now. I haven't really found anything else. <laughs> By the fourth year, I started to like it a bit better because it was a bit more functional, mm-hmm. if that makes sense. Even then, it's a bit guilty of not being particularly functional or all subjects are functional. Um but you can understand that they've got their purpose at the end of the day. But it's it's just something that over time you kind of go, oh, I've got to have a real go at this. This backup plan's got to become the plan from now on. Um, and that's how it all started, yeah. And when you say backup plan, there wasn't. it sounds like there wasn't necessarily a, a, f- a forefront plan. No. It was just that this was just something you were doing and cruising along and hoping something else came to you? Or? Yeah, I was hoping for just that, that lightning would strike and I'd sure. be inspired by something and go, oh, excellent, I'm going to become... Oh, what I'm going to become a barista. I, mm-hmm. I love coffee. Let's let's keep going. I'm going to become a sommelier. I love wine or something. There's so much pressure on kids when you come out of high school to go, all right, Jack, you want to study marketing? Excellent. You're going to be a marketer for the rest of your life. Congratulations, mm-hmm. mate. Mm-hmm. And I was like, do I really want to become an accountant for the rest of my life? Like, I want to find something to do for the rest of my life. Which is pretty far-fetched when you think about it. You're putting, you've existed on earth for 17, 18 years and you go, all right, well, for the next 60, 70 years, mm. you're going to keep doing that one thing. <laughs> and I think that's the kind of pressure that I put on myself to kind of go, all right, I'll study accounting and some sort of inspiration will hit me at some right. point because I'll be alive for the next 
50, you know, we'll see yeah. what happens. Mm-hmm. And maybe it'll hit me then. But I just kept going with the counting. Right. It is a very interesting point, isn't it, that we're expected to make these decisions when we're 16, 17 about what we're going to, you know, put a lot of time into, mm. put a lot of money into, yep. a huge opportunity cost, go on a uni. Yep. And then we don't even know what work is really at no. that time. We don't, we don't, we don't know no what idea, work is. Like, we don't understand what money is really either, do we? No. No, we don't know how to manage it. We don't know no. anything. But yeah, make this decision about what you're going to do for the next 50 years. You can't even legally drink yet. And you yeah. can't, well, <laughs> I'm not too sure if the laws have changed now, but you can't even legally drive yet. And mm. here you are putting kids in charge of the rest of their rest of mm. their lives. And mm. it, it's a huge investment, like you said, yes. a huge opportunity cost too. Yeah. So... That's why it was a backup plan, right? Just to kind of go, oh, something will hit me at some point. Yeah. And it didn't, which I'm thankful for because here we are now. So. Yeah. Yeah, it sounds like it worked out all right for you in the end. It's uh, I'm not sure if you will appreciate this, but the, the way that I, when people, sometimes people will ask me if they they should go to uni or do this or that. I don't know why they ask me because they know what I'm going to say. But <laughs> uh, one thing I think is a good way of, thinking about it is what's it going to cost in time and finances mm. plus the opportunity cost because if you look at going to uni for four years versus working for four years you know you're starting to get into oh, yeah. that hundreds of thousands of dollars in difference yep. in in outcome and then all of a sudden it, you watch it people's attitude changes a little oh, that's pretty expensive for and that's a good point you bring that up because i had a I have a, we have a client um, who started their own coffee shop based off of that. Unfortunately, their father had passed away and they've, they inherited a little bit of money and they've gone, you know what, rather than going to uni, I'm going to buy this coffee shop and that's going to be my business degree, mm-hmm. which you would learn so much more being thrown straight into the deep end going, hey, mate, you've got to pay suppliers. You've got to come up with your own costs, like what your cost is going to be to other people and paying other people and all sorts of things that, you know, a young kid, gets thrown into the deep end for mm. and you kind of go you probably would have like learn heaps from it in substitute for a $40,000 uni degree yeah. and you kind of go oh it, it's certainly interesting yeah and, and that's one way you can look at it hey if you lose go backwards $40,000 or whatever it's it's the same but I'd take the business experience over the oh, 100% the formal education yeah. myself <laughs> but uh, the other thing that was interesting about your story is you talk about then you go out you do uni right and then you go start being an accountant yep and you're not doing the advanced Excel modeling and all the no. all the things that you perhaps thought you were going to do. It's it's interesting in that respect because there's only really a couple of subjects at uni that prepare you for public practice accounting. Right. And that's tax and advanced tax. And that's really about it at the end of the day out of the 40-odd units that you study to get your uni degree. So you turn up thinking, excellent, I've got this all covered. I've graduated uni. Here I am working in a chartered accounting firm, which was my first gig. Let's get cracking. And they go, here's a mum's and dad's tax return. They've got a rental property. And you go, oh, okay, <laughs> that, that's cool. I'll cut my teeth on this. And maybe tomorrow I'll get, you know, some, some cash flow forecast for an ASX, two, <laughs> like ASX 200 company. And you just keep ticking along, ticking yeah. along. And another you know, tax you, return comes in another yeah. tax return comes in you finish that and then you get the tax return back that you've just finished for, for the mum and dad with the rental property and they go what on earth have you done and you're going what do you mean this is this is how uni taught me to do it and they go no no not at all and then you spend the next three hours sitting down you know which is part of the review process and everything like that to make sure you get the, the right product out the door mm-hmm. but you go what on earth has uni taught I, I'm completely unprepared for this mm-hmm. um, which really caught me by surprise when I, when I finished uni, you started a chartered accounting firm, you go, excellent, I'm good to go, I've got the skills. Which then probably, mate, I might beat you to a question that you might ask later, is the other accountants don't consider you to be an accountant. Right. Because you haven't done your CA or CPA yet. They've yeah. gone, yeah, yeah, good, good job, champ. You've got your bachelor's <laughs> in business, big whoop. We're all chartered accountants, we're all CPAs. And you kind of go, oh, but everyone else thinks I'm an accountant. And they go, yeah, that, that doesn't matter to us. You've, you've got to become mm. chartered or you've got to become certified. Do they say it explicitly like that? Oh, not so much, but it's sort of like everyone else. That's the message that you kind of get across. (laughs) And I can understand where that comes from because everyone goes through that that pain of a couple of years of having no social life whatsoever. You're studying most of the time. You're working full time, which often isn't just a sort of nine to five kind of gig. You're pulling a couple of extra hours in here and there. And you kind of go, is this really what I signed up for? And then you kind of 
there's carrots dangled at the end of it to kind of go, all right, well, if I get my CA, then everyone else, like all the accountants will think I'm an accountant. <laughs> then I'm an accountant. <laughs> and you just, in, it's, it's a big time investment. Yeah. And it's something that if you talk to a, to a young kid who's 17, 18, wanting to become a chartered accountant, you kind of go, look, mate, there's, there's a lot of time involved and a lot of, lot of investment into this. Even mm-hmm. when you finish your bachelor's, the other accountants won't think you're an accountant <laughs> until you finish your chartered or certified. <laughs> so it's an interesting road to take. Mm. And it brings up another point that I guess frustrates me a bit is, is that if, especially if you do well in school and uni, you're told this whole time that you're smart and that you're doing, you're going to be working on these big, you are working on big yeah. problems, like theoretical big problems and all this. And then you get out into the workforce and it feels like you've been dropped off a cliff. Like all of a sudden you're back to dealing with, you know, the most basic stuff. And I just don't quite understand why you build up over time to be able to do these yeah. smart things, clever things. And then, all right, off the cliff you go, start again from yeah. the bottom. Oh, mate, hundred percent. That, that first year of accounting, I was very fortunate enough to work with some very, very patient people because that first year was an apprenticeship at the end yeah. of the day. Like uni had you prepared with some basic skills, but you started at day dot with no skills whatsoever when you're working in public practice you kind of have to start again and you kind of go okay this is how I do a business activity statement and you go I don't think I even learned about that in uni I learned about GST and how it all works but I don't think I I remembered learning about a business activity statement Mm -hmm. how do you do a tax return and then you kind of cut your teeth on these individual things and then you kind of get up to working with mums and dads who own businesses and you go oh okay cool I I, I remember a little bit, bit about this from uni and how it all works and then you go give it to, to someone to review it and they go, what on earth has Morgan done again? What is all this? <laughs> and then it gives you that another step backwards and you kind of go, I don't think I was entirely prepared for this. But mm. if there's some mix, I always admired the kids who were able to study what they were doing and also work in what they were studying because that just put them miles mm. ahead, whether it's law or accounting mm-hmm. or marketing or whatever, you know, even in real estate where you see some kids work as sales associates get their sales ticket and kind of learn as an apprenticeship under that yeah puts them miles ahead of everyone else yeah so that on the job experience and that sort of persistence just yeah. working at it all the time works wonders i think i'm almost of the opinion it should be part of the degree 100 percent, mate I, I agree on that front so. <laughs> <laughs> but uh the other thing that was interesting about your foray into accounting was your first day i believe oh mate so my first day I was, I wore a tie because mm-hmm. I thought that's, that's what accounts do. We wear ties, we yeah. wear suits, and everything like that. So even I'm, if you're not an accountant yet. Even if you, yeah, even if you're not an accountant <laughs> yet. Even if they don't think you're an accountant, dress the part. Um, and so we, we had our first couple of hours of, of training and things, and then there's a bit of a welcome morning tea on. And one of the partners there gave me an absolute rinsing for not wearing my tie properly. And I just thought, I'm two hours into this. Is this really what I want to do? It was almost like a bit of a sign to say, Morgan, do you do you still want to keep becoming an accountant? Because yeah. you've got your accounting degree. You can still kind of bail out of it now if you don't want to become an accountant. I got absolutely rinsed in front of everyone for... Mm. I think my top button was not actually done up all the way. Right. Which he had a keen eye for it. So I'll give him attention to detail. Mm-hmm. Tick. But um, I got an absolute rinsing in front of everyone, which was sort of that sort of maybe graduate hazing kind of thing, whatever that might be. Mm. But my solution was just don't wear a tie again. Easy as that. So. Yeah, right. <laughs> and they didn't expect you to. No, after that, it kind of... Everyone else kind of wore ties where they had to, but there was a couple of people who didn't wear ties and you kind of thought, oh, okay, cool, I'm, I'm not alone here. Hmm. It's just some people choose to wear ties and yep. some people don't. So Right. And when you say the graduate hazing, do you think... I, I hear that story and I think that's probably not a great thing to do to someone. No. What's your view? Oh, look, mate, I, I wouldn't say so either. I think... It's just part of that framework where you've got to let people be people within your own business. Mm-hmm. I mean, within our business, when I think about it, I don't want to clone myself and work with four other Morgans. And mm-hmm. I dare say the same in your business, Jack. You don't want to work with four other Jacks. You want to let people be their own person within mm-hmm. your business. Bring a bit of personality. Bring a bit of whatever you want to bring to the table. You don't have to kind of force it down their throat that they've got to wear a tie or they've got to have their hair done this particular way or just be yourself, mate, and then things will work out from there. If you're a good accountant, you'll be a good accountant. If you'll be a good lawyer, you'll be a good lawyer, a good marketer. Just be yourself at the end of the day, I think, is is going to work best. But accountants are very good at putting things into boxes Mm -hmm. because at the end of the day, sometimes that's part of our job. 
yep. is putting numbers into boxes. So True. you've got to make sure it's... So I think that's where it came from. Right. And also the way I reconcile it in my head is kind of go, they probably copped a hell of a lot worse when they were graduating from much older accountants mm. on that side of things. Water off a duck's back at the end yeah. of the day, mate. But it's a funny story at the end. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so how long did it take for you to, to start enjoying it then? Probably took a couple of years. Right. It, you kind of cut your teeth on all the work and you go, I wasn't really liking it too much. I was kind of looking to go into commerce at that time, like being sort of working for a business as their internal accountant mm-hmm. at that particular point in time. Um, I was going, yeah, I'll, I'll keep going, I'll keep going. And I was even applying for graduate programs for like ASX two listed companies, even though I had a couple of years experience in public right. practice because I was that keen to kind of get out of it. But then you start getting introduced to clients mm-hmm. and that people side of things I thrived in. I loved it. It was just sort of seeing how Jack ran his business and you get to meet the person behind the numbers and you realize the impact that that actually makes on someone. It's a huge difference. I, mm. I fell in love with it then and there when I sort of met our first client and all it was was just a handshake and dropping off some documents. But I thought, those are the guys behind the numbers. Mm-hmm. I'm going to do my absolute best to make sure that we can get the best outcome we can. I'm going to think of all these different things because I saw Jack give me his documents. Yeah, You see the people behind the numbers and you realize the impact they have. And I was like, yep, this is it. This is the gig for me. I, I know mm. it. Mm. And it is... It almost is like a spectrum, right, where you can you can really focus on the technical side of things with whatever job you're doing or career and just sit by yourself and do your thing all the way through to you kind of only do the people side of things. But uni's certainly skewed towards the, the technical oh, side of things. It, it, there's so much that I learned working in the world, being sort of 18, 19-year-old kid, that I probably would never have learned at uni. Mm. I probably learned so much more from those first couple of jobs, actually talking to an adult and realizing like, oh shit, like you guys don't go out on weekends or like, because it's a novelty to you doing all this stuff because you're doing it for the first time. Whereas you're talking to, mate, I'm 31 now and you see these young kids running around, you go, yeah, I remember kind of doing that thing (laughs) and and you realize how much of a struggle it is sometimes for them to talk to adults Mm. because they're just not in the rhythm of doing it. They're used to school, they're used to everything else. So I found working in an actual workplace with real adults to be life-changing. You you realize that there's actual different people in the world, Mm -hmm. which I thought was huge. Like, I was like, oh, what do you mean? Like, I thought everyone had sort of a similar upbringing to yourself because naturally your school friends tend to be sort of similar to yourself. And you get out in the world and you realize, oh, everyone's got vastly different stories as to how they got to the desk that you're sitting next to. Yeah. So, And, And when you're dealing with people... There's not always a textbook answer to how to deal no. with it anymore, is there? It's not like you can sit the exam and there is an answer to this question. There's an answer to this question. Sometimes you're dealing with someone and think, I don't know how to help this person. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> and, and sometimes you you get asked the question and you kind of got to sleep on it. And you kind yeah. of got to go, all right, Jack sent me this email. I'll, I'll send him an email. I'll say, hey, mate, I'll get back to you tomorrow. And then think about it. Wake up the next morning and go, cool this is what's on jack's mind i think and even then you're only sometimes guessing at it Mm -hmm. but that interaction is huge it's such a huge learning curve yes um which yeah that's it's interesting mate and and how long did it take you to be able to confidently say i'm not sure right now give me 24 hours or however much time and i'll get back to you with an answer because when you're young that can you can almost feel that pressure to come up with the answer on the spot, even if you don't really yeah. know it. <laughs> oh, mate, I've been guilty of you know making mistakes on that front, thinking that oh, I've got to come up with an answer to this because Jack asked me it and I, I need to get back to him, rather than just saying, hey, mate, I don't really know. Give me a couple of days and I'll get back to you. Um, especially when it's sort of that complex you know, sort of area and you're kind of going, or where you need to get the answer right. Mm. You kind of got to go, cool, mate, give me a couple of days, I'll get back to you. That was probably something that I didn't quite learn probably about six or seven years into my career where you don't have to have all the answers at once. Right. And that's sort of that thing about being yourself where you say, hey, mate, I don't know, but I know someone who does. I'll go check with them and see what they reckon. And ironically, you're comfortable enough saying that once you've had more experience and you probably are more likely to have the answer. (laughs) I didn't even think of it that way. You actually are more likely to have the answer with that amount of experience. But you go, 
I'll just double check. I'll make yeah. sure that I'm 100% on it yeah. rather than going ahead and saying, yeah, Jack, go ahead and do it. No worries. <laughs> <laughs> but I understand you are also pretty passionate about financial literacy in these business owners that you are oh. dealing with. When, when did that come to the fore? Is it over this time when you're working with them? And it's you over see- time when you start working with people, mate. It's where you, you start to realize the people behind the numbers and you go, I'll pick on you, mate, because you're right in front of me. Yeah, Jack's a great me, marketer. Yeah. He's, he's been doing a phenomenal job at this. And I, naturally what comes with that is you kind of go, I'm going to start my own marketing business. I'm going to you know, start my own podcast as well. I'm pretty, pretty all right at that. I'm going to keep going with it. And you kind of go, you get all these numbers coming through the door and whatever it might be. And you're doing your best, but you're not necessarily literate with it. Mm. And you sometimes have people start businesses and it starts, you know, Smallly, and it starts growing and growing and growing until they employ someone. So they're now in charge of someone else's livelihood. And they still have kind of no idea as to what their numbers are saying to them. I was fascinated by that. And they go, well, that, that's what I see you for. Well, that's why I see my accountant once a year. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and sometimes I don't even see them at all. They just used to send an email and go, cool, I'll see you next year. There's so much more that as accountants we can bring to the table. So a big thing that we work with our clients on is let's know at least at the very least know the levers to pull on your business to make sure that you're making money mm-hmm. so working within real estate to mention that before pretty simple business in, in terms of the business model in terms of sell more houses collect more rent there's your revenue drivers of yep. your business and it's about talking with business owners about that as to that's very simply put but what are the nuances that we can change to make sure that we can collect a couple extra hundred dollars here that over you know, the space of a year that actually makes the difference of tens of thousands of dollars and mm-hmm. those tweaks within a business where you know and some people can be in business for 10 15 years and then start to pick it up because they've, mm. they've looked at those numbers for so long but when you're first starting a business and some businesses that we've worked with started their companies just by purely you know going to ASIC and registering the company themselves yeah um and then all of a sudden they're in charge of paying wages for people yeah. that they've employed mm-hmm. and you know there really should be some sort of at least a basic financial literacy (laughs) or you're not expected to know everything at the end of the day and that's where you get you know someone like ourselves involved yeah exactly like with marketing or starting a website or anything like that you go see an expert about it but at least have that sort of base level understanding yes and it it reminds me i host another podcast where someone said on that it's actually which was an interesting point. It's actually easier to get a driver's... Uh, it's easier to start a company than it is to get a driver's license. Oh, 100 Completely like become agree. a director. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's 100% true. Mm. There, there's no sort of points test that you don't get to you drive around a company no. for, for a couple of hours no. and do a three-point turn. Nothing like that. Yeah. You just turn up, sign on, on the dotted line, and away you go. Yeah. Start a business. Mm-hmm. Good luck. Mm. We, yeah. And what The other thing that... I thought about when you're talking there is you talk about 10 to 15 years it can take someone sometimes to to let's say become somewhat financial literate if I'm understanding what you said properly why does it take that long because I can't quite understand why someone would not want to know more about their numbers in that meantime that sounds like a long time to me to not it it is and it isn't because sometimes people are, are very guilty of focusing on being what they're good at and i can 100 percent relate to that i just happen to be an accountant so i I get to be guilty of doing that within my own business where i can look at the numbers and do everything like that but people's safety nets are often where they're comfortable at and where their strengths lie so in marketing you're going to fall back to going cool i'm just going to keep servicing my clients keep servicing my clients and as long as they keep paying me i'm making money and as long as i've got x amount of dollars in the bank account i'm sweet we've worked with a fair few clients like that where they go I've got $20,000 in the bank account. I know that I'm going to be able to pay my bills next week. I can pay my employees. I can pay super. Excellent. Mm -hmm. And you kind of go, how do you get to 20? Oh, I just know it's a good buffer. Why not 19? Oh, 20 is a round number. That's how I like to work with it. It's like, why not 15? Oh, well, 20 is just a good buffer for us. How how do you get to that thinking, Jack? I just like the the number 20 at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. And that financial literacy of going... Jack, what's, what's your break even, mate? Let, let's have a good look at this. What are the drivers of your business? Because sometimes you've got clients that just... A classic story, we had a client who never paid themselves a cent. Right. They, they were very fortunate to have a partner that was working and they lived off that wage and they never drew anything from the business until we started working with them. Wow. And we kind of went... And they'd been in business for a couple of years by that point. And you're going, 
where's the reward in this, mate? Mm. Like, you've got to draw something on it. Mm-hmm. Like, I just, I just thought the money wasn't mine, so I couldn't do anything with it. And a lot of a lot of people are guilty of it because you can turn up, submit your paperwork to ASIC, become a yep. company director, and away you go. And you don't need to mm-hmm. know a thing about finances. Yeah. So that's why we're so passionate about it is that just that basic level of literacy or we say to a lot of our clients, mate, pick up the phone. We're here to help you whenever, wherever, whatever's going on. Mm-hmm. You might think it, if you're asking us a dumb question, trust me, it's not. We've probably just been asked that 15 minutes ago from another client. So yeah. don't feel like you can't ask anything to us. So it's it's a fascinating space to be in that you can be in charge of something very important. Yes. And especially that can affect the livelihood of others. Yes. And not have a, a good grasp on it. You don't mm. need to be the best, but just that that basic level mm. of understanding, I think, would take some businesses a long, long way yeah. in their business career rather than, unfortunately, folding at the two or three year mark, which unfortunately sometimes most small businesses do. Yeah. And it also makes me think about one of the reasons why someone might not look at their numbers as much because you kind of don't want to know sometimes, right? Yep. <laughs> that's the other problem you must have. And that's... Is- Sometimes you can bury your head in the sand, but there's only yeah. so much longer you can yeah. bury your head in the sand yeah. for. It's a um, finite game, that one. Yeah, oh, exactly. <laughs> and sometimes we're not afraid to call our, cl- not call our clients out, but sort of mm. challenge them on it and yep. say, hey, Jack, mate, your margins are getting slimmer and slimmer. Mm-hmm. You know, um, minimum wage has gone up and don't forget super's gone up too. So you're actually crunching your margins pretty hard now, mate, where you were making 10% and it's not too, a great net profit margin in the first place anyway, but you're now making 6 so if something, you know, if you've got to shut down for a few days with coronavirus, I think it opened up a lot of business owners' eyes to go, all right, I actually really don't know what I don't know here. Mm-hmm. I need to make sure that my cash flow is all right. And it's been a blessing and a curse, this whole coronavirus thing, and the fact that business yeah. owners are becoming a lot more financially literate. They want mm-hmm. to know what their break even is. They want to know what's my cash flow for the next four weeks, what's turning up, what's popping up, will I have enough money for wages or rent, super, whatever might pop up. And I, th- I think it's been good from that perspective is that mm-hmm. businesses are getting more financially literate and what they're doing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I'm assuming you only need them to get to a certain point where you can oh. help them, right? Because, it, and it's the same thing, like when I help people with their, their growth, it's, yeah, I just need them to have a, a certain level of understanding. But if you're trying to work with someone who has no understanding, it's, it's ironically, you can't kind of help them because they're too far exactly. away. You, you want someone to be conversant. In it, yeah. and know what they're talking about with you. So when you say, "Hey, mate, let's let's look at our break even," you're going, "What's what's what's that? Can can someone t- like can we take a step back? You want to be like, "Oh, cool. Where's my break even sitting at?" Mm-hmm. So you at least know, "All right, cool. That's what I need to make a month to make sure that the bills are paid, lights are on." Not only just that within the business, but also Jack's personal life. Like that's all covered. Rents paid, mortgages paid, bills are paid, whatever it might be. That's the important side of it. You don't need to be able to calculate it. You just need to know, I need to know that. Mm-hmm. And I think that's the key there for, for most businesses is no, I don't know how to do it, but I know that I need to know about it. And that's sort of that that known unknown mm. is sort of the best way to put it is, I don't know what the answer is, but I know I need to find the answer for it for right. most businesses. And do you prefer to take on clients who are already there or will you are you happy to take on clients who are maybe before that part they don't know? We, do, no. we take on clients from all sorts of different spots in their life cycle. We work with clients who have fully formed finance teams where they've got a team of four or five within their business. We work with clients where they're doing the books on a Saturday morning kind of thing mm-hmm. and we're working with them too to help them to get to where they want to go. It's that full gamut yeah. of mums mm-hmm. and dads businesses of all sizes. Mm-hmm. That sort of... I always hate using the word SME or the term SME because it's such a vast array. And then most of the time, mums and dad businesses anyway, it, they just happen to have you know struck gold or you know hit the right note to, to get to where they are. But you're still working with a family business for the most part or a combination of families. And it's just about helping them on their journey of to where they want to go and what they want to do because you know not necessarily do they want to be this $100 million turnover business they're pretty happy with turning over a couple of million dollars and whatever their net profit margin might be because yep. it just works for them and their families. Mm. I think the, the growth strategist in me sees when you talk about different types of clients that some of them would have a what I call an education cost. Yep. So there's a whole lot more time and effort you have to put into educating them to a certain point to then be able to, to work with them. 
Yeah, and I think something that I've started to kind of realise is that everyone deserves to have access to a good accountant. Okay. And I think whether or not that's just a quick phone call to... And this is probably where we differentiate ourselves is we're not going to bill you based on a five-minute phone call. Jack, you're not going to get a bill for this podcast or anything like that where we're, we're time-based. It's, it's more about if it's a quick question, we can answer it in a couple of minutes. That's fine. That just strengthens our relationship together. Mm-hmm. And most of the time, we've just answered that for another client as well. So you're not alone there. Like, because business ownership can be decently lonely. Yeah. You, you might think you're the only one out there dealing with this problem. But I can tell you, looking at all these different businesses, there's probably a dozen other businesses dealing with this exact same problem. Yeah. Yesterday, I had the same conversation three times with three different clients. And it's all about hiring employees. And you just go, excellent mate thank you for making the phone call and they go i know this is a dumb question no 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 jack let's let's keep talking about it mate i want to make sure you're comfortable with it to keep moving and there is that education piece to it but i think that's sort of us giving back to the business community for the most part as best we can so right okay cool and you talk about when you did mention the smes before one other thing that that caught my eye is you talk about how they the startup community has kind of done a good job of teaching some basic financial and some basic and some basic growth growth metrics as well i'd say Mm. but that that i didn't think about that but the that's not necessarily what's the case for the sme community and it's almost as and and i admire that startup community for being able to do what they've done because they almost own the words they Mm. own the terms they own the functions that come with it and when you talk to a client about what their cash flow is, they go, I don't need to know that. I'm not a startup. I'm fine. Mm. Yeah, no, no, no. Let's take a step back, mate, because every business should know about this. I admire that side of that startup community because sometimes you often find that the people who are starting up these businesses are often doing trying to do their own cash flows. They're trying to have a look at, you know, what's that minimum viable product do we need to get out there to make sure that we can crack a break even or keep investing in our growth or whatever that might look like. And they almost own those terms. Mm. And you can be a bit more conversant with some startups sometimes, even though they're in the first couple of months of business because they know I've started this business because I need to get 100 people paying us 20 bucks a month to make sure some of our other co- like costs are covered. Yeah. Whereas sometimes you can you know, work with a hair salon owner and they just know I'm just here to cut hair and yeah. I, I know that I make money off the back of it. But there's so much more that comes to their business. Mm-hmm. It's the same business in a, in a lot of ways that they both need the same services. One the startup community tends to know that they need those services mm. whereas those mums and dads SMEs don't necessarily know that they need those services they just go I've been good at this for 20 odd or 10 odd years I'm going to try doing it myself yeah and just making that more financially literate I'm, I'm big on that mate yeah yeah well it just you think about how much money people must be leaving on the table just not <laughs> yeah. not looking at some of so, this stuff 10 years wow like that's Imagine if you were five percent better at your finances for ten years. And that's sometimes all it takes. Like there's there's a client that I'll I'll throw under the bus um, that we're meeting with next week, and it's it's literally we're we're meeting just about their pricing strategy and what mm. levers to pull to make sure their gross margins are sitting all right and their net profit margins are sitting all right. It's not necessarily a sexy conversation, but when you're shaving a couple of percent here, there, and everywhere, or increasing a couple of percent here, there, and everywhere, you start to make some really big differences. Yeah. And over time, that makes an even bigger difference where you go, all right, well, if we're operating like this for the next five years, well, if our exit plan is to sell the business at the end of the day, well, let's shave these margins a little bit better and do whatever we need to do. So we've got that exit strategy in mind Mm -hmm. and then sell out and sail off into the sunset. So, Yeah, and I'm going to throw another one of your clients under the bus. (laughs) And you talked about how you recently advised someone not to do an acquisition. It's... It's something that this has been a learning curve for me working with, with these different businesses, trying to really Im- embed ourselves as part of that finance function and, and that almost sort of fractional CFO that, that we like to sort of be within our clients' businesses. Part of that comes the strategy conversation. It's not always just about numbers and saying, hey, Jack, this is, what, this is your net profit for the month and this is where we tracked this time last year. It's sometimes just about the conversation as to where do you want to go and what do you want to do, mate? Hmm. And it was going to be a big acquisition for our client. It was going to be, you know, it was going to put them on the map in terms of their footprint in southeast Queensland. And it, where it worked, fit into their picture of, I just want to keep growing. And you kind of have to sit back and go, it was a decently sized acquisition. It was about $7 million. And I asked the question as we were kind of running through that basic due diligence stage, is kind of confirming all the numbers were looking okay. And, 
yep, everything's in order, all the employees are doing okay, we've got these types of agreements in place, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, doing all that basic stuff. And we got into the point where I kind of went, mate, if I gave you $7 million, what would you do with it? And we spent the next five, 10 minutes talking about all these things that they would do with $7 million. Not once was that acquisition even mentioned. Yeah. Which kind of let me ask the smart ass question and say, hey, mate, do you even want to do this? And he went, no, you know what? I, I don't think I do. And I said, mm. you want to know why? Because we've spent almost 10 minutes talking about this and not once did you mention this acquisition. Mm. And he's gone, yeah, okay, cool. Let's pull the pin on it. So what comes off the back of that is then, well, we want to grow the business. How do we get there? And you don't necessarily have to spend $7 million to grow by $7 million kind of thing. So we've kind of got a bit of an aggressive plan in place to grow with the kind of natural resources that they've got behind them rather than going out and spending $7 million. And, you know, funny numbers get a little bit number centric for a moment is that when we looked at the comparison between what it would take to pay that loan off that they would borrow to buy that $7 million business and if everything kind of goes somewhat according to plan, well, if everything goes according to plan with their growth strategy, they're getting there in half the time that it would take Mm. to pay off the loan. Mm. So you kind of go, well... Let's organically grow this for a second, and if the right opportunity pops up, then yeah, sure, let's let's buy it, let's let's acquire it. Yep. But let's wait for that to happen. Let's not just go out and buy for buying sake. Yes. Yeah, I, I come across some of this stuff sometimes as well from that growth perspective. Is that uh, I'll see sometimes I'll have people ask me if they think they should grow by acquisition, and sometimes that means going and raising money mm. to then buy another business. So. When you break it down, I'm like, okay, so you're going to give away part of your business for a start that you're going to give away for good. Mm -hmm. You know, that's gone now. And it might look okay in the short term. It might look okay in the first six months or whatever. Yep. And then the clients of the new business you've acquired start leaving anyway because they were there for other reasons and blah, blah, blah. And what I see it comes down to a lot of the time is you don't know how to grow on your own. Mm. And I believe every... my one of my core philosophies is every business should be able to grow on their own to an extent. Now, partnerships and referrals and all these type of things are good and they're fine and maybe they're a big chunk of your growth. But I I do believe if you want to take things, if you want to take control of your own destiny, that you should have ways that you can at least grow a bit yourself Mm. in-house with your own resources and skills, et cetera. Oh, absolutely, mate. And that um, your business can only rely for so long on referrals exactly you've, you've got to have those different arms or different pools of your business where you can not necessarily pluck a client out of that pool but you know that they're going to maybe visit your website and they come through a bit of seo or a bit of whatever that might be you know that hey jack's a good guy go talk to jack if you want to sort out your growth and your marketing and things like that you need to have those different pools because you don't know when those taps are going to turn off on those different pools yes so to source clients from everywhere or source your, your revenues from different streams mm-hmm. mate, that's that's the dream business you can have yeah and you don't actually have control of those taps no. someone else can turn the tap off oh, on you yeah <laughs> so um, i don't know if you see a bit of this but i can't stand this uh the forced referral um networks that you see sometimes is people almost have a kpi that if you're part of some of these groups you have to i have to go if yep. we're, we're part of the same group for example i have to give you two qualified referrals a month or something and then you've got to do the same for me and we, while you're trying to grow your business you've yeah. also got kpis for to my business <laughs> and not the same with me and i'm like oh god i don't i really don't like that mate i i tried that because I thought I've got some clients that rave about it really? and it works really well for their businesses okay it's not necessarily how I work I, I get like to get a good feel for people so that I know that I can trust Jack Jack's going to be mm. my man that when a client asks you know do you know someone who can help me with my growth and my marketing and things excellent go talk to Jack rather than having to be in that forced referral system that I think would be great for if you're starting up on your own and you don't have any sort of clients or business partnerships or things like that it probably fits in a little bit well but i think you're already busy trying to grow your own business the last thing you want is kpis and the stress of trying to build eight other businesses around the table (laughs) and it's just something that i can see it work really well for others right but i looked at it and just kind of went that's that's not for me right because i want to deal with rightly or wrongly my guy 
like my guy for this, mm. my guy for that. But, you know, I think, you know, Sally's a great lawyer, so I'm going to pass everything off to Sally in terms of yep. conveyancing or whatever it might be, mm-hmm. rather than being forced to pass all your stuff off to John because John's part of your group and you've yep. got to refer work to John. Yep. It's an, mate, it's a fascinating model because some people who are in it rave about it. But how can you... If you can't generate work, business for your for yourself, how can you generate all this business for everyone else? Fathers, I don't know, mate. <laughs> <laughs> I guess That's I, what it yeah, I guess if we had the answer, we'd be part of those groups. <laughs> but um, it's just been something, mate. I I went to go do it, yeah, and I I slowly kind of retreated out of it just because it's not that forced referral yeah. isn't me, yeah, and I think people clients especially would see through that 100 percent. they would go jack and morgan aren't anything like what the hell are they doing bloody business together for Mm. and then it's a poor reflection on you it's a poor reflection on you because i've just thrown you under the bus by saying yeah yeah, you can look after jack and sally for for doing all this stuff and really you might not or they might not even be an ideal client for you Mm. you might go morgan's done it again yeah he's referred me all this shit work i don't Mm. want it I don't know how to tell him, but we're all part of this group where we've got to refer work to each other. Yes. So I've just got to cop it. Yes. It's Which fa- yeah. there's going to have to be some shit coming through because if you have a certain amount, you have to send through. How can you possibly be qualifying all these people for everyone else? Surely you're clutching at straws at some point and just go, anything with the pulse can go see Jack and that counts as my referral for this week. So. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, very interesting. So have you done anything in particular to grow credit? Like have you have you... What have you tried? Mate, we try... Well, we're in the middle at the moment of trying some long-form blog posts and SEO-optimized stuff. So, we're kind of trialing that at the moment to see where it goes, um, which is a bit different and a bit interesting for us. We're, we're going to have a fully-fledged... You'll, you'll like this, a fully-fledged social media sort of campaign and sort of actually posting on our socials and things like that to let people know that we're here um, because we've managed to grow really well off the back of referrals. Mm-hmm. There's only so much you can do to grow your business off the back of referrals. It's the ultimate compliment, I think, but there's only so much more people can refer you work because it's quite funny, actually, in the fact that we all manage to somehow keep ourselves within the same circles and only a few degrees away from each other. So at some point, you're going to exhaust that referral pool. Hmm. There's only going to be so many people that are after a new accountant or a new lawyer or a new doctor or whatever it might be until you exhaust that pool of people that you're dealing with until you move on to the next town. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's why multi-level marketing doesn't work, right? <laughs> <laughs> but that's a that's a whole other story. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, very cool. Well, now that's a really interesting to hear what you've been up to and your thoughts and all that. What's what's plans for the future? Like, what do you see going forward? You've been in business seven months, did you say now? Yeah, so fully fledged in business for, for seven months yep. now. Um, it's where... In terms of our service offering, it's been fascinating to see what clients have uploaded themselves into what sort of sides of the business. We've got clients who purely just want us to kind of provide that CFO and strategy for their business. Whilst we do offer bookkeeping and that accounting and tax compliance side of our business, they just go, no, I just want you to do that. Mm -hmm. We have clients where we purely just look after their bookkeeping and they might even take up the CFO and strategy services that we've got, but they go and see another accountant. So for us, it's more about just refining our message and what we're doing so that we can be more to that one client for us, but then also offer those services and kind of come up with that process-driven sort of finance function for our clients where they can just go, excellent, the guys at credit have got my back when it comes to my finances. I know that if I have a question, I can ask the team and they've got it covered. That's kind of where we want to get to is just refining that process. We're getting there. It's not yep. quite there yet. I don't think it'll ever be... I don't think anyone's business is ever, you know... Perfect. Perfect. Yeah. But we're getting there. And it's just that process that we're, we're working on now, working with a couple of, of good partnerships with different businesses on that front where you can offer some complimentary services or, or where we can, you know, you have that conversation pop up over and over again. You know, do you know a good financial planner? Something like that where you go, excellent. Here are the guys that we're working with that will be able to sort you out. No worries. So that's... That's our biggest focus for the next sort of 12 to 18 months right. is just bedding down some of those relationships, having that service offering that we've got, but bedding that down with our clients because they're effectively three different businesses at the end of the day that we just mm-hmm. happen to have under this brand of credit. Yeah, right. Oh, very cool. Um, 
yeah, we'll wrap up in a second because it's been yeah, but that's been awesome to to hear your story and no worries, and hear how it's going. I, I hope it keeps going really well. Um, but uh, but great great job so far, I'd say. And uh, thanks, mate. You know, it's it's always great to see people take the leap and. Uh, it is unfortunate in Australia sometimes I think that we do tear each other down, hence why I was so interested in in that wasn't the case for you at the start. So it's good to hear those stories. I think it's good, mate, in the fact that, you know, tall poppy syndrome, it's a term that's inherently Australian. Like, it's, it's developed here, tall poppy syndrome, that kind of term there. And I think we're starting to see that slowly go away. I think if people are being themselves, people go excellent jack good on mm-hmm. you mate keep keep going for it yeah and i think that's where you kind of see where people aren't being themselves and they go jack you just mate you're taking the piss mate yeah. like you're not being yourself here you don't <laughs> do you really want those clients do you really want to work with those people mm-hmm. or whatever that might be so i think it's getting better that attitude towards mm-hmm. people having a good crack i think is is slowly disappearing and people right. are willing to support others yeah yeah very cool i'm, I'm all for that hopefully Hopefully that keeps continuing on going forward. If anyone wanted to get in touch with you or or seek you out and have a chat or maybe they want to do business with you, whatever they 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 want, how would they get in touch? What's the best way? Best way is find us on the on the website. So www.credit.com.au. Credit's a bit of a funky spelling, everyone. So it's C R E D I double T E. Um and you can just find us on the website or you can find me on socials. Mm-hmm. I'm on LinkedIn, yep. Facebook, Instagram. Twitter, not so much, but yeah, but all the usual suspects. <laughs> well, I found you on LinkedIn, so Excellent. that's um, one place you can go, listeners. So, uh, but thanks for being here today, Morgan. Uh, Mate, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to, to hear your story and to hear it's, how it's all came to be. I really, really enjoyed that. Mate, thank you very much. Thanks for having us. No worries. Thank you for listening to this episode of The Push Podcast. Show notes can be found at bethepush.com forward slash podcast and clicking on the relevant episode link. Remember to subscribe and I look forward to talking to you again soon.